Well, this morning I want to talk about the purest. We're in Matthew chapter 5, looking at two sections of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we're going to look at two things. They're fairly connected in their theme, and I think they fit very well with the events of this last week. So, and of course, I don't think I put in the scriptures right, so you might have to put up with me here for a moment. I don't even think we have men, do we? Okay, so if you got your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48. And we'll hear the word of God here. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand it over, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, then go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said also, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you only greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That last phrase in that scripture just sets me on edge. I don't know about you, but be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What an immense challenge. This whole section of scripture that we've been covering the last several weeks, Jesus sets milestones for us. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. Yet I tell you that if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Wow. You feel like the bar is up here somewhere? And if you don't, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The holy God of Israel. That one, that's who I have to compare myself to and that's what I have to be. Wow. Unreachable. And the scripture clearly tells us that's the case for humanity. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we hear from the book of Romans. There's a lot for us to think about here. And like I said, I think this passage really lends itself to what we've seen this last week. I don't know about you, but boy, I just struggle. First, we get the news that Hillary gets off. Now, some of you might think, yeah, that's fine. And there are others of us that just think there's a travesty of justice being carried on there. We wonder if the small guy gets the same break or if it's only those that are extremely well connected. Then we see two tragic situations Again, where video has caught a police officer in a difficult situation and two black men, two African-American men lose their lives in a confrontation or an experience with a police officer, which then inflames the Black Lives Matter crowd. And we're seeing that their rhetoric is becoming more and more aggressive and hostile, more and more hateful more and more bigoted. And then we hear about 12 Dallas police officers getting gunned down in the streets, five of them at least, to my knowledge this morning, who've lost their lives. And you can bet it feels frustrating. And if we allow ourselves, it could tempt us to not be what God wants us to be. It could tempt us to feel anger and resentment and hatred towards other people. 
who do not deserve our anger, resentment, or hatred. Just because of the color of their skin or their political affiliation. God doesn't give us that right. That's why I think we have to remember that we will never save this world on the world's terms. We will never see salvation for people if we witness our faith in terms of how the world responds to these events. We are called to be different. And this morning, Scripture clearly points that out to us. But I want to take you first just to set kind of our minds in, in, in this direction with a passage from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And I think these words speak to us today with the revelation that it first spoke to that church in Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and mighty and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Let me stop there and put that in context for you. Our struggle is not against Democrats or Republicans or independents. Our struggle is not against socialists, communists, Marxists, capitalists. Our struggle is not against people of another political point of view or people of another religious point of view. Our struggle is not against the wealthy, the establishment, the 1% or the 99%. Our struggle is not against the educated or the uneducated, the wealthy or the poor. Our struggle is not against men. Our struggle is not against women. Our struggle is not against straight or gay or transgendered. I was reminded this morning the great part of growing older is that as I lose my mind, it won't matter which best room I walk into. I won't care. Our struggle is not against all these things. Verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the dark powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. That's why we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. When we put our eyes on to those dark powers and the effects that they have in this world, we get caught up into those things. Let me exam give you an example from my early life as a Christian with my friends, the Mormons. I become a Christian and I learn that here's this book that tells me about who God is and what he's about and how to follow him and how to live my life according to him. And I start reading that book and I'm finding out all these beautiful, wonderful insights about who God is and how he made the world and how he set up this world to under, be understood and how I'm a part of that and how I was created with a special purpose and an identity known to God. How he wants me to accomplish and do great things in his name. And then there's another group that I'm very closely related to and have so many friends in and they have a very different understanding than what this book presents to me. In fact, they claim to have a higher knowledge, a higher truth. And so I started studying about what they believe so I could argue with them, so I could struggle against them to show them the right way. And I argued and I struggled and I read and I studied and I found out more and more about Mormonism, as did my other Christian friends. We talked about it constantly. Did you read this in this book? Did you hear about this? Did you see what Joseph Smith said here and how that doesn't compare to the Bible? And we had all this down. And we kept reading and, reading and, and understanding Mormonism more and more. And then the funny thing happened. Those young people that I knew that 
once loved Jesus started slipping away one by one. And while they would never become a Mormon, they no longer knew how to be a Christian. Their eyes so focused on what was wrong that they forgot to remember who was right. Fortunately, God helped me navigate that and I got through that. But there have been times in my life where I have been tempted to allow myself to become more worldly than I want to be. Less of a person of light than a person of love and joy and peace and those qualities that Jesus gives to us. Now, I think there are some things that help us, and it's laid out right here in the Scriptures for us. Little quirky sayings found in the Scripture that we, we read one part, but we sort of miss another. You've heard this said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, boy, we feel the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth, don't we? When somebody does something wrong, we want what? Justice. Justice. That's why it was so hard for so many to swallow what one politician got away with. But I'll remind you, there was probably a politician on the other side who did just the same sort of thing and they got away with it too. I don't know why we get so surprised It's just the way it works. But if we read this, we key on this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth thing, but Jesus challenges us with this. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Oh man, that's all I want to do is resist the evil person. You know, I want things to be right in this world. I want this world to be good. I want an American culture that is godly and that has been what it has been for many years, although, quite frankly, maybe that's more of a fairy tale than it's a truth. America hasn't always been the shining city set upon the hill. There are aspects that it has been. There have been times when it seems in our history that we have been. But I can also point to you great, great injustices, great evil that's happened throughout our history. Somebody lied about George Washington one time and said he couldn't tell a lie, that he didn't chop down the cherry tree. And while that's all cute stuff that we learn in elementary school, it wasn't the truth. And sometimes we need to sit back a little bit and be a little bit more realistic about the humanity of our nation. The ideals are great and we should be fighting for them. And we should want justice and liberty for all, not just for ourselves. Jesus tells us, do not resist an evil person. But I have to tell you, there are evil people. You will meet them, and don't be naive about it. There will be people who want to do you harm. And you say, well, how do I protect myself and my family from those kind of people, from those kind of situations? I mean, that's what we want to do. Nobody loves their children wishes them to encounter bad people. We're afraid of who might be in the bathroom stall next to our daughter, aren't we? or even our son. Do not resist the evil person. Evil's there. And I think that we have a right to make sure that we do protect them. But we need to understand that there is something even greater and more important for us to be thinking about. And that is making sure that they know the right one that we as Christian parents and grandparents need to be teaching these lessons about the Scripture in our homes and in our lives, and we need to live them out. It's not a Sunday school teacher that's going to bring your child to faith. 
It's going to be your witness in front of them and the assistance of that Sunday school teacher. It's going to be the men and women around you that are godly men and women who you love and support, who you fellowship with, and who you have a relationship with. And you don't always have to fully agree with them, which is one of the great problems we have in churches nowadays. We are so concerned about our little particular point of theology that we forget to love one another. You might fall on the wrong side of the millennial spectrum or the eschatology spectrum, and all of a sudden we treat loving Christians as if they aren't brothers and sisters. Second thing I think I see in this scripture is that we give in strength. Sometimes I think Christians think they are the meek, the mild, the weak and meek. In fact, we are the ones with the greatest strength. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Jesus says, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anybody wants to sue you, take your shirt and hand it over and hand your shirt or coat over as well. So take your shirt and your coat and give it to them. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. That's a reference to the Roman military. A little thing that they could do, any citizen in the Roman Empire at that time that wasn't Roman. A Roman soldier could walk up to you and say, you're going to carry my armament and my coat and my equipment and you're going to go one mile. They had the legal right to ask you to carry it all for one mile. No matter where you were, the time of day, the situation, pick it up, carry it. Jesus said, you know what? Show them your strength. Show them who you are and carry it too. The point being that you were witnessing to this person, that you were calling attention to yourself for a unique reason. While they were mistreating you, you could show them love and care. Not because you were forced, but because you made a choice to turn the tables in your life and do something better for someone else. Now I want to just address one point clearly that I also believe in. Be perceptive and discerning about this point. Jesus didn't teach us to stick our faces out to get slapped. And I think there are a lot of Christians who think it's their business to stick their nose into other people's business and tell them how they should be living or not living instead of praying for them and loving them and walking with them. They get right into their business and guess what happens? They don't get a warm reception they get slapped. And then they want to sit back and say, oh, I'm being persecuted. No, you're just getting a natural human relationship action. Sometimes we have to discern when to share the gospel, when to stand up, when to be the right person, when to do the right thing. And when we're assertive and aggressive with our message instead of loving and caring, The message isn't received. The next point I want to talk about this morning is everything depends on your attitude. Everything depends on your attitude. Let's go back to that scripture one more time. I've got to find my, my point here. Okay, the next section of scripture says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And we feel that, we feel very at ease with that. That's a natural human response. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then verse 45, these two little funny words, that you, that you, may be children of your Father in heaven. See, it's a choice. It's a choice. Love people, even those who hate you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. There are evil people. 
There are people who will do us wrong. There will be people who insult us. There will be people who misunderstand us, who treat us poorly. And sometimes we're tempted to think that this world is just set against us in such a way that there is never any winning. But that's not what the scripture teaches us. What the scripture teaches us is something very different and Jesus brings us out. When God says in his word, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's three things that I'd say we got to remember when we hear this passage. One, God is impartial. God loves you just like he loves the next person. Even if that person doesn't accept him and rejects him and fights against him, God still loves that person and sent his son to die for him. Two, God loves the whole world. It's an emphasis that we understand from John verse, chapter 3, verse 16, for God loved the whole world that he gave his one and only begotten son. Right? And three, God will judge fairly. And this is the point we have to remember. God will judge fairly. We can leave everyone else in his hands. Even if they mistreat us, even if they are working hard against us and his kingdom, God will take care of this in the end. That's why we have to do better than those who don't know better. This is why we're called to be the light of the world. This is why we're called to shine our witness. Do better than those who don't know better. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Funny thing. Sometimes I see non-Christians in this world behaving better than Christians. And they have no reason to know how to live correctly, to please God. They seem less judgmental, less angry. And you know what? In this day and age, unfortunately, I think we got a very angry church. I think the world is full of very angry Christians. uh, Emmy Collier, many years ago, once described this church, way, way back in the day, as the 30 mean Christians, the rest of Christian love to hate. That was an interesting insight from such a sweet woman as Emmy. But she said, you know what? God did a work in this church. And he turned the attitude around. And he brought joy and grace through Jesus Christ to empower this church to become something really big in this community. And that's the same thing God wants to do with us today. I think it's up to us. It hasn't been on our minds as the trustees and as the pastor that the pews are a little thinner than they have been in the past. That hasn't escaped our attention. And we've been giving it some prayer and some consideration. What would God have us do? Now, there's some natural responses that we kind of felt. You know, one, maybe we should advertise. You know, we started looking into some advertisement. You know, there's some different things that we could do. One of the trustees reminded us that Pastor Scott used to say, we can put out the advertisement, but it's best if we are our own best advertisement. If we let people know There's a special place in this little town that shows the love of Jesus to people. And we love simply, and we love deeply. And I think there's a third thing. You're supposed to sing loud when you're here at worship. There are always going to be times when we struggle There are always going to be times when the pews are a little thin. There's going to be times when the offering isn't sufficient to do all the things we want to do. But we have a God who supplies all our riches in glory. And if we live in a way that shows his 
goodness towards us, if we love one another the way I know we can love one another, then other people will come and join us and be a part of things. I'd encourage you maybe to reach out to some folks that you haven't seen for a while. Just remind them, nothing's changed here. We are still a happy church. We are still a loving church. And we sure would love to see you with us again. You know, it's interesting how Jesus shared with these, us these things. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Now, just sit back for a moment and remember somebody that was sitting there probably that day listening to Jesus. Jesus is using that phrase, tax collectors, kind of in a derogatory way. They were the pagans. They were the most hated people in his community. And there was who sitting there with him? Anybody want to take a guess? One of his disciples, one of the first people he called, Matthew, the very author of this passage. Don't even the tax collectors do that? And Matthew was a tax collector. Jesus wasn't being very politically correct. He wasn't being very sensitive about maybe Matthew's feelings at that moment. But he said, you know what? Even the tax collectors do the right thing from time to time. You know, Peter went back to fishing when Jesus was laid in the grave before Jesus was rec um, resurrected. What do you think Matthew did? He probably went back to his old ways. Probably figured there's nothing else to do here. I better go start making some money again. And sometimes I think that when we look at the injustices in this world, when we think there's no hope, when it's buried in the grave, if you will, for that moment, we want to go back and be what we were so many years ago. But you can't. You can't because there's a Savior who is resurrected and alive and well. And he lays out, some expectations for us. And it's that last verse, verse 48, that one that just gets me. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. First thing I want to tell you, it's about you. And it's not about the rest of the world. Your salvation, who you are, what God wants you to be, doesn't depend upon what Hillary Clinton got away with this last week or didn't get away with. Who you are, what God wants you to be, and where you're going in life, doesn't matter what happens with Black Lives Matter. It comes down to you. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we hear these encouraging words. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Wow. As a diehard conservative and Republican, I hear those words and I think, I need to pray for Hillary Clinton. I don't particularly like her or what she stands for, but that isn't what I'm supposed to be about. I need to pray for her, for Barack Obama. For anybody I see on the other side of the aisle. In humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I don't think that means that I have to agree with anybody. I can vote my conscience. But the way I think about her, so that she is a child of God who deserves his grace and his love and his mercy. She deserves to be prayed for. And should she become president, 
We need to pray for her leadership and her discernment and her guidance. God help us. That we be the church. That we be stronger and bigger than our issues. God help us. That we're concerned about what he wants us to be instead of fixing the world. It continues on, it says, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The most important verse of this passage this morning from Matthew I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. It's your attitude. It's the attitude of your heart. Is it to be concerned about how you are pleasing to God, or is it to be how you're going to make the rest of the world right? What politician deserves your vote? Is it going to be, Lord, help me to be humble and help me to show Jesus Christ to this world or is it let me show them what's right? And I struggle with that all the time, especially when it comes down to the Yahoo message boards. I can tell a lot of people what's right and wrong. My wife hates me when I'm on the computer like that. And I hear it in the back of my head through her, and the prompting of God's Spirit. Give it to me. Let it go. Follow me. Your word for the week. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to let go of the things that we think are important. Help us not to struggle against the flesh, the blood, the person on the other side of the aisle, someone we feel is set against us. But help us, Father, to be concerned about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of true freedom with other people in a timely and loving manner. That we might be pleasing to you and followers of Jesus. And that is the only place that we ever have the hope of being perfect, Father, as you are. There in Jesus. Bless us, Father, with your spirit and move us by your love. Inspire us to go out and do great things for a Savior who is so great. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand. Let's try that.